everybody. We are so excited to welcome you all to the Reimagine Innovation session from Simple to Complex, a solution approach brought to you by DeVille Technologies. My name is Amanda Griffin, and I'm Vice President of Education and Program Management here at United Fresh. Now, before we kick things off, I want to remind you all of a few session logistics that you're probably all very familiar with. As you can see, we are in Zoom webinar. We welcome any questions, so type them into the Q&A and chat pods throughout the presentation, and we'll be sure to answer them in a timely fashion. Lastly, this session is being recorded, and we will share it in the near future. Now, it is my pleasure to hand things off to Emily DeFlieger, Marketing Specialist. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. DeVille is a solutions-oriented manufacturing technology company that caters to food processing companies of all sizes that require sanitary, durable, practical, and efficient food cutting equipment. We provide high capacity shredders, dicers, and slicers for cheese, meat, fruits, and vegetables. We partner with our clients to design a solution that best responds to their food cutting needs. Every detail is meticulously thought out so that we can deliver a solution that surpasses their expectations. Today, we will hear from Jonathan Buchner, Market Manager of the Fruit and Vegetables Industry with DeVille Technology. Jonathan has a degree in process engineering and business. Jonathan also has a great deal of experience working with clients one-on-one -on -one to create new products and increase the capacity cut quality while maintaining a sh or shrinking footprint. Outside of work, Jonathan loves being a father to his beautiful one-year-old daughter. Now let's hear from Jonathan on From Simple to Complex, a Solution Approach. So much for that, Emily. I'm just going to switch over here um, to that slide presentation. I mean, we got a couple of polling questions ready uh, to start off uh, with Stacy. She's taking care of those. So, Stacy, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and throw those up, um, and we'll see how some people respond. Looks like we got some clicks going on. Wait another second here. Stacy, do we have results? 71% yes, 29% some of the time. Okay, let's see how true that is. Let's go to that next one, Stacy. And answers. Okay, so 71, almost three quarters of us answered yes. Um, and the last three months, we only had less than a quarter um, an audit online um, efficiency. So we might wanna talk about that. Maybe some people will rethink some of their answers. So I'm gonna maximize screen here in just a minute. Really appreciate you bearing with me on that. So I'm, I'm Jonathan Bittner. I'm a market manager uh, for fruits and vegetables um, and alternative protein here at DeVille Technologies. And we're an industrial food cutting company. Uh, our day in, day out work is doing audits on line efficiency, things like that with processors focused on that industrial cutting. So from simple to complex, a solutions approach. If you have any questions, um, either about the agenda or about anything, Feel free to just reach out via chat and we'll get those, those questions answered in real time. Um, I'm hoping that everyone will be interactive if something pops into your head, um, let it out and we're all trying to just learn together. So first and foremost, um, I see a lot of the people on this call are our colleagues and, and personal friends in the industry, but some of you I, I'm not familiar yet. So we'll cover a little bit of who DeVille is and then dive into the R&D side, why R&D is key for a solutions approach, then the difference between equipment and solution providing. We might see some answers of those polling questions change um, from that 75% when we dive into what truly being a, a partner consultively is as an OEM and if we're truly treating all of our vendors as consultative partners and putting some of the, the onus on them um, to be helping you guys as processors. So first of all, our, our why is to make food safe and accessible for all. 
And this is especially true looking back on this, this last year in fruits and vegetables with the challenges that, that our whole globe has, has faced. The who we are in the DeVille philosophy is a, a client-centric company. It's applying the ultimate solution-based manufacturing and cutting technology specifically for the food industry. So we like to think we have the solutions approach dialed in, and I'd like to stay away from solutions and focus more on some of the, the mantra and the way of thinking behind these things so that regardless of exactly what you're trying to do with the solutions approach, everything here can be directly applied to every vendor that you're working with and even some of those internal team discussions. So our approach, yes, it's DeVille's approach. Hopefully everyone you interact with at DeVille is gonna do this with you, but it's also our approach here because it's a solutions approach. And you're never gonna find a solution if you don't understand the challenge. So this seems super simple and that's awesome, but I feel like a lot less based on those poll questions of your vendors are doing a lot of this than we think. So first we need to ask, that's simple, simple enough. Then we confirm and what I really almost wanted to write was ask again, that's what confirm means. An example of this capacity, what, what do you need, sir? Hey, I need 10,000 pounds an hour. Ask again, okay, what capacity do you need in a day? Oh, I need 70,000 pounds an hour a, a day. Okay, eight hours in a day, that's 80. Um, hour lunch break, what's going on? Ask and then confirm, ask again and really dive in. At the bottom of this, we see solution and consult directly next to each other. For your guys' internal teams on a solutions approach, this should all happen collaboratively at that table with, if possible, that vendor. If DeVille is that vendor, after asking and confirming, I am going to go off to our engineering department, our controls engineers, some of our direct process and applications engineers, and we're all going to sit down, review all of this information, and then come back to you to confirm it one more time before trying to propose a solution. There's also a time frame in this approach that needs to be taken care of. If I ask someone what capacity they need, I'm gonna say, what capacity do you need today? What capacity do you need at X point in the future? And what else is possible? If you win that deal that you talked about, how does this go out the window and what are those new capacities? And how can we build for this? Now that applies in both very simple and complex things. We'll cover this later in a minute. But on the left is a 15 minute conversion kit install. And on the right is a, a full piece of equipment. I said we dive into to r and Every photo we see here was actually created on one of those two previous slide pieces of equipment. The shredding application in the center fold there was made on that gap set technology. That's actually my, my hand down there in lovely Bakersfield, California. And those other four pictures, both the cauliflower rice, the seitan, the noodles, the beautiful crinkle cut is all done on our Treatise 240 Dicer. So when we're doing R&D, we wanna really be focusing on cross application competency and solution leveling. And both of those things fall back on asking all of those questions and confirming them both now and for the future. That cauliflower rice photo is from a client in, in Arizona that is also, guess what, now asking for solutions upper left-hand corner on the noodle cut. We were lucky enough to talk about the treatise and the complexity of everything it can do immediately. And because of that, they were aware that a very different product portfolio was capable on that same line. So this gets us to goal influenced equipment providing. Very, very simple slide, very, very simple way of doing business. An RFQ comes in, there is a yield number, a specification, three ace dice at a capacity, 12,000 pounds an hour. And all of your vendors say, absolutely, 
I can do this, I have the solution. And what they're really telling you is, I have the capability of providing a piece of equipment. Yield specification and capacity is our starting place. It's established through need, and then it is proven through R&D. And so many people work on the aspect of goal-influenced equipment providing, establish a yield, a specification, and a capacity, and that's it. Instead of asking and then confirming all those questions, and then they hope that they're actually doing the best solution through a best man wins, the highest capacity or the best yield number. And I like to call that designing to value. And it's actually the, the lowest way of doing process engineering in your plant. So we wanna move past this knowing it's the foundation, but we can do better. Doing better is moving from influence to directive and goal-directed goal equipment providing is something I like to call designing with value. Now that includes looking at our pullable levers, the controls we have over variables. I'll cover some of this in, in better depth for you. Sanitation and operational implications and the exchange that those have. And then the cost of, of ownership of the equipment, both that capital outlay day one and then what does it look like on the books? What are the replacement parts costing on a yearly basis, even 30 years down the line, which is why it's so important to go back and ask more questions than we even think that we need to. Now, an example of this with some integrated solutions is gonna be our, our Treatise 240 series of dicers. That's centerfold right here with some ancillary equipment. This was a small line and the solution went in just outside of, of Las Vegas when we're at PAC and we're eating at restaurants. There's a, a great possibility that just about everything for 80% of those restaurants came off of what's pictured exactly here. So a little bit of a aside, but it's important. So as we walk into the levers and the interchange, I wanna do that through examining just some of the internals of that treatise so that this becomes concrete to everyone. So the treatise simplifies maintenance, it's easily accessible. We've minimized downtime through a removable cartridge system. There's safer handling of cutting tools as well because of some of the ancillary tools that we provide. That whole system is removable through three bolts and the product and the drive zone are completely separated. I am breezing through this. We're not trying to talk about treatises today. Just make sure you know enough so that the points make sense. Continuing on, that impeller is removable. There's a shelf designed there. It hangs on the front of the unit so that in that cleaning time, even in that hour of downtime over lunch, when we were asking and then confirming those questions, that machine could be properly cleaned again and sanitized by one person very quickly. So that shelf hangs on the machine, goes in place, and one operator can pull that out, slide it back in. We have some patents for better cut quality through the angle set system. And then something I will cover more in depth because it's an example of that solution approach is the active crash protection system on the treatise. And technically it's a, a slipper clutch similar to a manual transmission on a car. This connects the, the motor from the drivetrain, the coupling disc and a, a timing belt. People are interested. I'll talk about this stuff all day, but I don't wanna dive into the technicals on this. It's not the reason we're here. So that second step, I call it efficient production infrastructure. We started again at yield specification and capacity. And oftentimes that RFQ comes out, we sent it to eight different people and five, six came back and they matched the yield specification and capacity. And then most of you move on to these things. What's the best piece of equipment that fit that minimum spec? And we'll go into why that's actually kind of a backwards way of doing it. But on that treatise, some of those pullable levers, so you have concrete examples, are speed settings. The RPM's adjustable. Cutting tools are removable and exchangeable. 
we can adjust some of the, the torque factors and variables on that machine for tomatoes versus something else as well. Going into the sanitation and operational implications, there's tool-less design on those conveyors that I showed you that are installed down there in Las Vegas. You'll probably eat off a lot of that food. Change over time, therefore, is very quick. That treatise has that crash and jam protection, and it is actually able to be disassembled while it is still on that production line. I was in California for tomatoes last week, um, taking out two pieces of equipment and putting in actually that treatise. And they were very excited that we didn't need to bring the piece of equipment somewhere else for disassembly, that a tooling change and swabs and all those things could be done without removing it from the line. Cost of ownership, parts, cost availability, uptime, the life, is this for five years, is it 30 years, and maintenance time, and then let's multiply that by difficulty. Let's look at the whole thing. Now, if we look at that, that's the way I think 90% of the people on this call are doing things. What we'd like to move to is add that consultative OEM partnership, and this is that capstone. And that's a true solutions approach, solution-driven goal setting. And you notice it includes the foundations that everyone is doing and doing very well. We have yield specifications, capacity. We're still front loading this very heavily. In R&D, the unknowns become known. And that's oftentimes what is separating in some of those RFQs, something that looks good on paper and something that's a true solution. With designing to value, that first one, that will get you, get you by with a single new piece of equipment. Designing with value when we look at all these pullable levers is better for full new equipment elements and when we increase that complexity. And designing for value with that consultative OEM partnership is actually a mindset. And it needs to be shared between the supplier and the processor. So if you're not asking as many of those questions as that vendor is asking, then you don't actually both have that mindset and therefore there's none of that OEM partnership happening. Now, if we dive back to simple to complex, that 15 minute install on this conversion kit was actually designed and we did that because there was so much of a piece of competing equipment out there that was old, that was being retired or was not doing the job. And a client said, your solution, your machine is awesome but I don't have enough money in the capital budget to replace 30 machines in a, a span of a couple of years. But the heart, the cutting tools in your solution, those patents are what I need. That's where the value is. And instead of getting an RFQ, and this is the difference for a solution, let's increase capacity by 60% and writing a quote for our version, our piece of equipment and sending it back and then saying no, the asking and the confirming of those questions went on for months. And we developed a conversion kit that we now sell to the entire industry that allows you to take that legacy piece of equipment and for minimal investment, still up that capacity by 60%, still get that cut quality, still have the solution, even on that old drivetrain, that old motor, and that and many other processors are able to spread out the cost of upgrading to current levels of technology instead of feel all that. And then on the right-hand side there, that's a little bit more complex. I told you that crash protection system was integral. We actually went to a bunch of our clients throughout California, Texas, Australia, the rest of the world that had the old generation. And because we were writing down all the things they said were good, were bad, were ugly, could be improved. Every single one of them said, when there is a crash, it is downtime, it's a problem. And we went to the drawing board and designed that system. And we're the only ones that do it. These are very, very simple solutions. When we get into an entire line, the difference between your vendor or your vendors doing this and truly partnering with you guys 
and not even talking about equipment until they've spent maybe two hours talking and going back and forth on questions with you is going to become very obvious. So when we do a full system and we analyze and then we automate, we monitor, we do all of these things within dairy, meat, fruits and vegetables, alternative protein, it all starts from a piece of conversational content for each section of that line, determining those needs. And even a full line starts on a per equipment basis. And we ask on the tumbling side, this is a dairy line, for example, how much production needs to be had per hour and what's peak, what's not, how much shredding of that cheese, is it separate, is it the same? So that we're actually designing a fully balanced line that fits now and in the future. So my challenge to everybody, we had 75% of you all saying that you do treat all of your vendors as a true consultative partner, but then a vast majority said there hasn't been a conversation even in the last several months, the last quarter, the last three months about auditing that line, about increasing the efficiency to reach out, send an email and just surprise your vendor. You build my packaging equipment. I would like you to audit my line. Can you tell me where we have efficiency to gain and see how they respond? My job personally, if I'm not having that conversation, even about pieces of equipment that DeVille doesn't manufacture and telling our clients, I think you could do better at XYZ company. I saw this elsewhere. The numbers are pretty good. I'm not doing my job. And that even includes equipment we don't manufacture, even more so what we do manufacture. So again, that's my challenge is to reach out. He said the bulk of you do treat them as consultative partners, ask for that audit. And if they say, what, what do you mean? Then please reevaluate whether they truly are that consultative partner. And if they say, hey, you're right, you've been in a pandemic, how would you like me to do this? I'd love to walk through your plant, even via Zoom, get some data from you, take them up on that, and then all learn together from that. And I now I'm, I'm just opening up the floor to questions. I'm gonna stop the, the share here. Uh, so maybe a few more, depending on how this works, jump on, we're all learning together, but, Hopefully we uh, have some good interaction and I, I really want to thank you for your time today, but I am handing this over to Emily now as I stop the share uh, to feel those and to close us out. All right, well, um, in the meantime, as Emily, Emily, you're off mute, but I do see, we do have the anonymous attendee question that I think you covered a little bit. Um, we don't have any coming into the chat, but I can, um, open the floor. Emily, did you have any that you received? Well, just so we can kind of go over this one, um, Jonathan, the question was, do you do product testing for clients and is there a cost associated for consultative approach? So yes, um, R&D is key. I and mean, if I understood the, the question, absolutely, we do product testing. We don't charge for that. Going back to how important a yield and a capacity and a cut quality is to a client and processors and processing our industry in general. We consider that something we have to do to earn the opportunity for business. So we have a full R&D lab actually on the other side of, of one of our buildings here with a couple million dollars of equipment in it. Um, I get my hands dirty on a weekly basis, cutting, cutting all sorts of things and overnighting it back to the client because we wanna prove that out, that we are the right solution. And being consultative means that if we're not sure, we all do the work on our end before we involve the time, the energy and the money of that processor. So I wanna be 100% sure that I have a solution or I'm working towards one Maybe I need some input from the client before I can go to R&D 2.0. So then we do that. But I am doing all of that R&D up front. Excellent question. Yeah. Emily, I don't see any more questions. Did you get any on your end? I'm double checking to see if we have any more questions. 
Feel free to type them guys into the chat or the Q&A box. We'll take them from either spot. Jonathan, it just means your uh, presentation was more than informative and didn't leave any questions. Well, some, sometimes that's, that's good. <laughs> there's, there's definitely a lot to unpack here. So there's definitely more conversation to be had. So far, we don't have any more questions. I think they're, I think they're all answered. For, for giggles. Got, oh, we got, got one, one really quick. Can you explain the R&D process for noodling? Um, can you repeat that, Emily? Sorry. Can you explain the R and D process for noodling? So we had no idea. That's actually a, a really good question. Um, we had no idea that we could do do noodles um, on that treatise, and we were being asked a lot. And those familiar and whoever asked the question probably already knows there's a very complicated way of producing um, zoodles, right? at volume and it takes a couple pieces of equipment. It's, it's kind of labor intensive. And there was some other dicers already involved and they said, we need X. And long story short, we said, okay, keep doing what you're doing. And we went to the R&D lab and we pulled just about all the, all the tooling that's sitting on the shelf uh, for a couple different pieces of equipment. And we bought a ton of produce and we just figured it out. And it didn't take a day, it, it took a while. Um, and then we continued to perfect it. But long story short, it just goes to say what consultative approach is for clients, because it was probably three, three, four weeks before we came back with that client and said, absolutely, we have a solution. And then talking about R&D 2.0, I don't have access to 20,000 pounds of zucchini in my R&D lab. So I have a solution. And I know it works, but what I need to do is get access to 20,000 pounds to try to make zoodles on that actual production line. Will you partner with me, being Mr. Client? I'm this level of confidence on this at you know, 30 pounds of produce. Can we get this just shipped for free to your facility? And you got a whole semi load of these and let's run this offline first through a thousand pounds, get it to QA, make sure we're maintaining everything throughout a day that we need to. And then let's put it on a line and see what the true max, max capacity is. It was not an overnight sensation solution. It was true, get down and dirty with the client individually and going back to asking and confirming, we had to change even that spec and be flexible probably four or five different times. Um, for the person that was asking the question, they're probably familiar that a lot of, of other noodle creation technologies kind of round those edges. And that treatise makes more of a, a square cut, more of a fettuccine noodle as it were. And they had to have some flexibility knowing that that was another way to create a noodle. And then marketing had to make that decision for that large processor, if being able to get this to market finally at a price point that was profitable to them was worth that small scope change in the way that that noodle looked. But we were able to step forward with them with video, photos, being there in person with the marketing team that entire time and have those discussions and then have real data through the ops team on what that capacity was capable of if they were willing to make that change. So they saw where that moved the needle on the bottom line for them. And it was really an all hands on deck um, from both, both companies you know, that were involved, both, both us and the client, to then decide that it made sense to go that way. Great, you know what, as you were speaking, we do have one more question that came in. Um, in your opinion, how does the alternative protein industry differ from the F and V industry in terms of approach? Do you have any examples? Oh, wow. Okay. So I, I handle the, the alternative protein market uh, nationwide for DeVille. Uh, we focus on, on shredding, um, 
crumbling, all sorts of different things, have some large, large clients, and I handle quite a bit of fruits and vegetables. That's my bread and butter. Some of the biggest differences to me are the level of hygiene um, that is required, and then the attitude um, that comes in the alternative protein market, because a lot of these, these players, these food scientists and all sorts have come to the, the new cool thing and they have a lot of experience and they're coming from dairy, they're coming from fruits and vegetables, they're coming from bakery, and there's a lot of different thoughts on the way to do things. Fruit and vegetable is a world that we enter um, and I tell everyone, I came out of uh, the software world previous life, I will never leave you know, fruit and vegetable in the food industry. It's a family and, and everyone is so, so great but it also means that we have a bunch of people that have been here for 30 years with a ton of experience, and we maybe are a little stuck in their ways. So to maybe say it politely, uh, I think fruit and vegetable is a little bit more set um, in some of those operational mindsets, and alternative protein is begging for a solution, and it doesn't matter how that comes. Um, if someone woke up in the middle of the night and light bulb um, or if they're sitting in our lab and we say, for the heck of it, why don't we try X, you know, and we speed up RPMs or we change torque and we create a brand new product. And there's a little bit more openness then to working with us, knowing we can create that full rest of that line to match and to make that capacity work, if that makes sense, to, to do whatever it takes to create some new product that people are going to be excited about. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what are the main challenges clients are facing based on your experience? I'd, I'd say prior to COVID, I would say FISMA. So food safety modernization. Um, fruit and vegetable is, is definitely behind, quite frankly, on sanitary design. Some of the other markets that DeVille serves. So because I was trained USDA and, and dairy, and that is, you know, we're the king of the hill um, in dairy, it's been an interesting thing for fruit and vegetables stepping forward and making a choice, I think, as an industry on what we're going to do with sanitary design. And because we're less regulated than some of those other industries, making smart choices um, and not the minimum choices, personally, I feel is our our biggest hurdle and our biggest threat. I also think that just labor shortages, um, we have a lot of problems and, and United Fresh is, is partnering uh, with, with Washington and, and a lot of our processors are, are working hard to solve some of the labor issues. You know, I personally, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin, you know, I went and became a German engineer, spent some time in Germany. The first time I was on the border was for this job in food processing, you know, Yuma, Arizona, working with a lot of the, the member companies of United Fresh. And I really was a, hey, we need a, we need a wall. Yes, you know, let's do this. Um, and not getting political about it, but just let's have proper immigration and talking and spending time in the fields and the farmers and hearing. It's taking my, my employees four hours in the morning to get to their place of work because it, they just happen to live across the line and it's threatening me actually getting to harvest and harvest at a good price point. Just labor and either having an automated solution and going to the technology companies like ourselves and then needing less labor, that is one solution. But something I like to talk to my clients about personally is how do we take your labor and move it to a better value-added activity? We don't want someone, you know, cutting by hand, you know, an avocado for, for 10 hours a day. That sounds like arthritis to me. Can we move them to do something that's maybe a, a little better and give them even a better paying job? Um, but hygienic design um, and, and food safety, always, forever, it's never going to change. I think that's something we have to be vigilant on. And then the talk of the last probably eight, 10 years, and it'll continue till we figure it out, is definitely going to be the labor shortage and then treating our, our labor as our most valuable resource because it's not having the coolest piece of, of dicing equipment as much as I would like it to be. It's our, our people um, and our knowledge in our industry. Great. 
and we need to maintain that. Right, I could not agree with you more on that last statement there. Um, I think, Jonathan, we are out of questions. Any uh, any comments you want to make before we turn it to Emily to close us out? I'm I'm curious, Amanda, if any of those poll answers have changed um, for those that are with us here. And if we have a minute for that, that'd be that'd be quite interesting, just personally to me. And maybe um, they'll talk to you about it afterwards. Uh, yeah, we could actually, Stacy. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the polling question real quick, and I'm going to relaunch it, and we'll allow people to change their results. So, a reminder: you had in the first polling question, 71% were yes. Um, just as a reminder. So let's relaunch, and it's going to clear the results. So everybody is on the line. Let's go ahead and fill this polling question out again. All right, anybody have a last minute answer they want to put in there? Okay. All right, so Jonathan, I'm going to end it. I'm going to share the results for you to react to. Okay, that's that's statistically significant there. So, but I'm also really happy we still, we only lost 10%. It, it means a lot of us are doing the right things. And there's, as I said, so much knowledge in this industry. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. All right. Well, then to your question, let's go on to number two and go ahead and relaunch it. A reminder, we were at zero to three months was at 23 percent. Three to six was at 31 percent. Six months and beyond was at 46 percent. So for folks on the line, we are relaunching and away we go. And if this one changes, Amanda, I'll, I'll wonder if we were all uh, paying attention, so. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end it and get people's results in for you. There you go. And, and that makes sense. So hopefully that, that call to action didn't fall on deaf ears. And if we launch this in, in a couple of weeks, that answer drastically changes. All right, anything else you want to share before we turn it back to Emily to close us out? No, I think we're ready. Emily, the floor is yours. Great, thank you both. And thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for your insightful presentation. And thank you to all who have joined us today. We, re we really do appreciate it. The recording will be sent out once um, the metadata is done. Uh, we appreciate you guys joining us live and we hope you found it very valuable. Thank you and have a great day all.